Welcome to Radio Free Sunroot. You're listening to the interview podcast, Voices for Nature and Peace, where we discuss issues of ecology, empire, justice, and consciousness. We feature a variety of guests who are aware of the challenges of our time and who are working to address them. Here's your host, Calibri Ter Sonnenblum. The U.S. Clusterfuck, featuring Forrest Palmer. An electrical engineer by training, Forrest Palmer is an activist who lives in Houston, Texas. His work can be found at Wrong Kind of Green, which advocates an anti-capitalist approach to environmental activism. We talked on September 5th and touched on 2020, the George Floyd protests, the plight of millennials, Bernie Sanders, the ongoing collapse of the U.S., COVID-19, the flawed nature of the U.S. Constitution, the inadequacy of a Green New Deal, climate chaos, climate denialism on both sides of the political aisle, the lack of class awareness in the U.S., the impossibility of returning to the so-called glory days of post-World War II America, the need for radical change beyond the ballot box, the corporate media, and near-term human extinction. One thing that I've been noticing about 2020 is that there's a lot of people who are like, wow, things are messed up. And it's like, well, things have always been messed up. It just seems like 2020 is a year when more people are recognizing that for some reason. Uh, I think because it's disaffecting them from a personal level. Um, I think that if most people, especially here in the United States, where uh, numbers vary, but uh, from what I've been following, you have 40 million people that are unemployed due to the to the coronavirus. So I don't think people would feel the way that they do right now if that hadn't come about. Because ultimately, and I'll tell anybody this, regardless of how I feel about it or anyone feels about it, we live in a capitalist system. So even though we talk about things such as environmental issues, and we can get more into that if you want to, and all of the other uh, resource issues that we have going on, if people can't pay their monthly bills and be able to put food on their table, then that's when they, throughout history, throughout, or at least during the time that we've seen this capitalist system being the, at the forefront of any type of economic paradigm that we have going on in the world, that is the time where they actually feel tense, they get violent, and they start to uh, be so afraid that they actually do start to look into their own self-interest to whatever extent that is. Right. Because it's uh, I certainly would not be the first one to observe that the Black Lives Matters protests, uh, you know, specifically around the murder of George Floyd this year. uh, It seems like they wouldn't have happened with such energy if it hadn't been for the pandemic. Correct. I mean, if if you look at it, it, the only thing I'll say is that whenever you have seen uh, a black person, uh, black man specifically killed in such a manner. What you've seen is more black people take to the streets and then more times often than not after whatever verdict comes in against the person that was being tried for this individual's murder. But this happened right after he was killed or you saw all this upheaval across the country. Now, what most people need to realize is that a good number, especially in places like Portland, in my, I'm not going to say exclusively, but definitely the majority were white people. So when have we ever seen that in history? Now, my, I don't say supposition, but, but what I'm proposing is that uh, you would not see that amount of white people in the streets if it wasn't for the fact that they are being hurt economically due to the, due to the coronavirus. Because there, there's no other rationale for it. Right. But the one thing that we've seen throughout history is that if white people are being hurt economically, more times often than not, they will take it upon like people of color, for lack of a better term. So it could be black people, brown people or whatever. But the one thing that I have noticed is that we have come far along enough now 
to whatever extent that is, uh, that you have white people who will now come out not against black people, but will identify with black people and brown people when they are hurt to say, like, we're going through this also. We understand your pain. To quote, to, to use a quote from Bill Clinton, I understand <laughs> your pain. Right. So they're coming out now in full force because they are not against black people and blaming them for the things that happen. It's like, hey, I'm going through this also, and I see that the state is the problem. Right. And what, what, what you say there makes me also think about the fact that so many of the people at these protests have been younger people, millennials and younger. And those are people who, uh, even before the pandemic, were not doing as well economically as their parents or as they had been led to expect. Correct. Once again, uh, if you look at the uh, amount of um, student loan debt, let's say here in uh, America specifically, uh, it is now more than credit card debt. Uh, credit card debt has really been just something that has come about in the post World War II era. Era, excuse me. So, uh, if that's the case, you have to ask yourself when you could basically work yourself through school up until maybe the late late 1970s, and now you have to take out all these loans, and now it has surpassed credit card debt. Then who is actually accumulating all this debt? Well, since white people and young young white people specifically are the ones that are predominantly in college, even more so than anybody else. I'm not saying like black and brown people aren't accumulating debt also. I also have my own school, student loans. If I'm not mistaken, I think that uh, former President Barack Obama, or as I, I call him lovingly, Barry, and we'll always call him that, he didn't pay off his loans until well into his presidency. So you have all these people who over the years have said, OK, well, you need to go to school. You need to do these things in order to have a job or, or, or have assurances of, of employment. And slowly but surely, it's gravitated towards just being so astronomically high that the only way that you can make it through is if you do get all these loans. So. When young white people are now like, OK, well, I have to take all these loans for uh, for for schooling. I can't blame it on uh, uh, Jamal or, or, or Consuela or anybody else. I have to look and say, OK, well, they're telling me that I have to take out these loans to get this education. And then even when I get the education, I'm not guaranteed of a job. So they are now starting to see like, well, you know, what? I've been snowed for so long and they're outraged and they're upset. So they're taken to the streets. And even though it's it, it, the catalyst was uh, George Floyd, the powder keg was already there. So all you needed was that spark. But the spark is not just the death of this one black man. It is about the system in and of itself continuously and perpetually lying to the people who are at the lowest rung of society, who have no place to go now, and who actually come to the point that it is the system and not just black people or, or Latinos or, or Muslims or whoever it is that you want to say is the boogeyman to what it is that they're going through. It strikes me, I hadn't thought of it before, but it strikes me that the timing of uh, Bernie Sanders campaign uh, flaming out uh, could also be an element. And, you know, whether they were correct or not in believing this, a lot of people, especially young people, felt that uh, – Bernie Sanders could do something about some of these issues. And then when the when he was very clearly uh, and openly cheated, I think that this probably was uh, might have been a last straw for some people, too. Uh, I, I concur with that. Uh, I, I agree, because um, even though, uh, in all honesty, uh, I'm not a Bernie Sanders fan. I never have been. I wasn't going to vote for him. Uh, personally, I haven't voted since 2000, and that was for Ralph Nader. Mm. Uh, and now I'm so far removed from that. Later, I, I wouldn't even think about voting for him, although uh, I will be totally honest. I have a lot of respect for him on a personal level because he's someone that's dedicated his life to the American people of all ilks, of all walks of life. So um, I, I will say that on a personal level. Now, on a political, ideological, social level, I, I wouldn't vote for him again. But these young people... I think that 
if Bernie Sanders would have got the nomination, I don't think that they would be out in the streets, but I think that that would also be to their detriment because Bernie Sanders at the end of the day was someone who's been able to acquiesce to all the different components that are the cause of their misery. So Bernie Sanders has been able to exist for all intents and purposes, even though he's labeled as an independent, he's always caucus with the Democrats. So he's not somebody who's going to get into office if he, if he would have won the presidency and actually change things at a systemic level. He would have made his deals and he would have made his, his different uh, shortcuts in order to facilitate making his presidency successful and then also, I guess, making, making sure that whatever proposals he gave to the people, he was able to meet to, to some extent. Like, I don't think he would have got universal hair. No, no, I take that back. Correction. He would not have got universal health care because that is not something that the system is in place to actually take care of. He would have just been somebody who got in there and then given him like, like maybe a, I don't know, maybe a, a, a lower amount on, on their on the health care bills. But it would not have been a systemic change because he is not in place for that. He is someone to tell you that this is possible. But yet still he still has to deal with a Congress. He can't go in there, and even if he wanted to, and change things as he would see fit, or even as how he's promising his constituents that he would see fit. He always has to acquiesce to the ones that are, that are in place in order to hold the reins on his ability to make the changes that he's promising to you. So the young people should be in the street, and I, and be quite honest with you, I'm glad that Bernie Sanders didn't get the nomination, because it's better that they are in the street, and they're understanding that they're not going to get what it is that they desire in this world, regardless if Bernie Sanders was uh, uh, got the uh, Democratic nomination or not. The fact that he was going for the Democratic nomination says more than anything else as the fact that he was totally aligned with the two-party system, was been a detriment to everyone on this planet, to be quite honest with you, definitely here in America. Right, yeah, because obviously systemic change is is the only way forward i mean for for survival at this point honestly i mean the 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 environment uh cannot afford this current system anymore and given that systemic change is impossible through the ballot box uh then yes in that sense it's it's necessary that people be on the street because really at this point in um in the history of the united states it's there can't really be an improvement at the systemic level, can there? I mean, isn't it really just collapse at this point? Uh, I, I believe so. And I know that a lot of people don't want to hear that in mainstream society. But um, uh, I, I give you a, a case in point. Uh, recently, and I'm sure you've seen it, there was an article in The Atlantic where uh, President Trump, and that's why I, I don't call him Trump, I call him Trump, uh, he uh, says some disparaging things about the military and specifically uh, soldiers that have been killed, called them suckers and, and whatnot. Now he's doing damage control, coming out and saying that he didn't say it and, and, and this that, and other. But here's the thing, though. If you look at the article, which is very well written, although the sources are anonymous, you can tell that um, the author was able to get a lot of information from people that were actually there. Um, I know for a certainty that most soldiers and most people in the military are going to still vote for, for Trump. And even though he says some of the most harsh and, and disgusting things about them, call them cowards and losers and all these different things, they're still going to vote for him. So at that juncture, when people don't even recognize that the man that they're supporting has no respect for them, what else is there other than a collapse? And then we can even go back eight years previous to this. I mean, I can say the same thing about uh, uh, Barack Obama, uh, Barry. Uh, he said things and, and, and tongue lashings towards black people, but yet still, he, was, he, he still is beloved and revered in the black community. So when the people don't understand who their enemy is, who has no respect for them, then there is nothing else short of collapse is actually going to answer all the affecting us at a personal level and then even at an environmental level. I, I, me personally, as I'm more of a social commentary person than anything else, I have accepted that in my own personal life. And now I've gone forward and say, okay, well, I'm going to apprise people of this fact. But 
in a world where in order for us to provide a Western lifestyle, specifically an American lifestyle, to everyone on this planet, you would need five planet Earths. Now, how can you legitimately go to someone and say, and say Africa or some other, uh, or and tell these people like, okay, well, if you work hard, you will be able to experience the lifestyle that we have over here. That's disingenuous. By any measure or definition of the world, that is disingenuous. So if people still believe that, then there really is no hope for them outside of collapse. Actually, there is no answer by the system that we consider to be our salvation. Right. Yeah, because it seems like that that's a good word, salvation. That's what it seems like partisans on either side uh, are are seeking or are claiming that their candidate is going to provide them. And, and you know, I, I uh, have only voted for president once since the year 2000, and that was in 2016. I voted for Jill Stein so that I could take a picture of my ballot and put it online to troll Hillary supporters with, you know. So I, I, I'm right there with you. But, you know, of course, here we are in this post-convention, pre-election part of the year, and, you know, the, you know, one fourth of the population is claiming that that Biden is the savior. One fourth is claiming that Trump is the savior, and then the other half, uh, well, is honestly just kind of setting it out as usual. Well, I, I'll say like because I, I will be totally honest with anyone, and I look at things from a left perspective, right? Although my foundation as uh, I am an engineer by by teaching, and my father was an electrical engineer, so that's how I was brought up. I go off of math and science more so than anything else. So, for example, let's look at the coronavirus. What most people don't understand is that it's not the number of people that's getting sick. It's about the number of people that are going to the hospital. Now, uh, I don't want you to quote me, but I read that in the 1970s, that's when we reached our apex as far as the amount of are in all the hospitals across the United States. I believe it was over a million plus, like 1.25 million. Now, in 2020, we have less than we did in the 1970s, which was mind-boggling to me. I wouldn't think that was the case. When you think about the amount of elderly that we have right now, you would think that it would be it would be more, in, in, in my opinion, but, but it's less. So when people look at the coronavirus, they're just looking at it like, oh, well, death and sickness. No, if you get sick, you're going to go to the hospital. But then what that is, it becomes a burden on the system in and of itself. So if you get sick right now, you get the flu. And let's say it's not the corona. Let's say you just get the flu. And it's bad enough as we get older, it has more of a disaffect upon our, our, our body than when we were young. So you might go, well, there won't be a bill for you. There won't be a bill in ICU for you if it even becomes that that bad. And that's what most people don't understand when it comes to everything that's going on right now. So they look at it just like, okay, well, it's either to get the get the uh, uh, a vaccine or will it's not real or whatever it is. People really don't look at it in a rational aspect. And if they looked at it in a rational aspect, then they would be able to assess things upon life, and then also for the betterment of the society that they're in. But when you don't understand those things, then you're more than likely going to gravitate towards the people who tell you what it is that you. That's one thing that the Democrats and Republicans do. They tell us what we want to hear and not the truth. Everyone wants to everyone wants to wants to hear things that are, are are beneficial to their mentality as far as feeling that they're more than what they are. So the Democrats will get uh, 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 um, information from Biden or or whatever candidate it may be, and it doesn't even have to be present. And then they're going to tell them, like, oh, well, these people are bad. And even though they may be, what they're telling them is that their position is good. All the evidence proves that their their position isn't any better or not that much better than the people who are evil. And now we've reached a point where the stupidity is now keeping us from staying alive. Not, not where it's going to hurt successive generations. It's going to keep all of us from being alive who are existing at this present juncture. Right. And part of me thinks that this has been part of the national character of the United States 
from the very beginning and that the only thing that's changed is the circumstances and the stakes. Uh, well, uh, I mean, let's be honest. I'll tell anybody this. If you look at the Constitution, it was set up to benefit money, white men who are landowners. That's it. Now, after a lot of trials and tribulations, it's been able to be inclusive on a on a superficial level for other people. Like they've given black people to vote. Oh, black men, to be quite honest with you, it was initially black men, which was problematic because for black men to get the vote, that visits into patriarchy and misogyny because black women couldn't vote, even though black men were given it vote after after the Civil War. So then you had to wait for, I believe it was 1921, off the top of my head, that women were given the vote. So that was all inclusive. But yet still you had Jim Crow and uh, patriarchy, misogyny, all these other things. So it's always been a battle against white men that actually have power and money and land and the whole nine and everybody else. The problem has been everybody else has never looked at it as like, okay, well, we're in this group and we need to align our, our, uh, our anger towards the people who actually are, are, are in power. But you're right, since the inception of this country, it's always been the benefit a certain individual, a certain power structure to the benefit, to, to the uh, uh, non-benefit of everyone else. All right? be, be it the indigenous that were here before any of us came, be it women, be it black people, be it Latinos. I mean, you can go into the to uh, Texas and how the fact like they brought Americans in there for for all that land because I think it was a, a, a it, it it was it was very cheap to get land in Texas. And then we came in there, Americans being who we are, and then we said, hey, you know what? We have this land. We don't identify with the Latino. We don't identify with the Mexican state. We identify with America. So then a war popped off, and then it became an independent nation, and then eventually it became inclusive of the American state. But there is no way that you can take this country and say that it's always looked out for the people that were at the lowest rung of society, even though professed that it was always going to do that, it never has and it never will. It isn't capable of that. It isn't set up for that. And the system is diametrically opposed to those at the lowest rung of society ever being able to rise up en masse to deal with everything that's going on in this world. Right, because at this point in, in the history of the U.S. too, like there's, uh, I mean, in one way of talking about it, there's simply not the oomph left anymore to to do anything big to to accomplish anything deep um or or expansive because the energy is just running out at this point as the whole system starts to degrade and and, and break down i mean i think that you know the the uh, the concept of a quote green new deal you know a big huge fancy project it's like well i don't i don't know if the united states is capable of taking on a project that big at this point I, I I will uh, defer to, uh, and I'm going to give a plug right here. I don't know if you're going to put this in. Uh, it is uh, Corey Morningstar from Wrong Kind of Green. Uh, mm -hmm. I assist her in that endeavor. But uh, uh, she has done more work for uh, trying to put a, a, a finger on the pulse of exactly how the Green New Deal is uh, smoke and mirrors and how it is of no use to anybody on this planet as far as saving the environment. Uh, even though I know that that is a toehold for the Democratic Party in trying to lay a platform out or how they're going to address this uh, in environmental issue. But even if this society was set up to actually address the environmental issue, I think from a, a intellectual level, uh, America isn't prepared. So even if you even if uh, solar cell panels and wind farms and all these different things were actually able to stop the envir environmental cataclysm cataclysm that's right on the on the precipice of affecting us in our daily lives, it's already happening to other people across the globe. But once it affects our daily lives, people will still be averse to it because they feel like it's too hitched to 
what they consider leftism, socialism, communism, and the whole nine, which is averse to most people in this country. I, in regards, and even if you were to go and talk to most of the people currently that are in the Black Lives Movement, and then even if you go back to most people that were in the Civil Rights Movement back in the 1960s and 1950s, I know because these are the people that raised me personally, and then also because historically this is the case, they were against communism, communism and leftism also. And I'm just going to put it in one bowl and just say like anything that was of a leftist construct or mindset, which is the antithesis of capitalism, they've always been averse to it also. Right? Recently, uh, there was a celebration of uh, Jackie Robinson and, you know, as an entrance into the uh, Major League Baseball. But yet and still, you can go and find where he went in front of the House on Un-American Activities Commission and he said some disparaging things uh, about communism and about leftism. And he was applauded for that. In fact, that made it that much easier for him to be seen as the uh, shining light, per se, as far as far as uh, uh, being uh, um, the first black man in, in Major League Baseball. And his embrace by modern mainstream white society. So if that's the case, then no one's really going to currently no one's really going to want to embrace climate change, energy issues, solar cell panels, anything that is accepted by people that are considered on the liberal and left will always be an anathema to the American psyche. The system, uh, the way the system works is that it only works well for a small number of people and then doesn't work well for a majority of people because that is, that is the design of the system itself. Correct. It's designed only to benefit a certain amount of people than the two documents that people feel is sacrosanct. And that's the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. So even though people feel as if those documents are ones that are inclusive of all people, they're really exclusive. And we have been battling for the past uh, 250 years or so trying to get past all of the structures that were in place because of those documents and being able to address all of the people who have redressed because it was meant to benefit just white men who had money and who had land. And that's been the battle since the inception of this country. There's nothing else. That and the biggest hurdle that we have to get past as far as addressing this is capitalism, which is the one thing that most people embrace, which is to their detriment. It isn't beneficial to people. And because of the funnel of capitalism, it was it is what was able to allow these white men of money to be able to get the land and procurement and everything it is that, that they've that they've been able to extend past the, the past 250 years. What we've seen is that all the people who now embrace capitalism don't understand that it is what gave those people their privileges back then and which continue to this day. And that has been something that the blind spot in America, which disables us from ever being able to actually be uh, 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 um, an enemy to the state, which is what we should be since the state is out for our best interests. Right. And now what's happening at this point that is being uh, roundly ignored um, is the state of the environment, the state of the climate, the state of our degrading ecosystems, which are now really affecting our ability to survive on this planet at all. Conservative estimates say that we'll be at six degrees C Celsius as far as a change in, in our in our climate. Now, most people really don't understand what that means, but if you break it down, that six degrees C is like 12 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, if I remember correctly. Now, if that's the case, all I will say is that look at your body temperature. Uh, if you see that, okay, well, if, 
it's 97.5 degrees Fahrenheit. I believe that's the uh, human body temperature. If you raise your body temperature by 12 degrees Fahrenheit, you would be dead, more than likely. Yes. You, you would be physically dead. Like, we would not be talking now if I just all of a sudden instantaneously just raised my body temperature to 12 degrees Fahrenheit. I would be dead. So what people need to realize is that you can't just make these drastic changes when it comes to the climate. Because if so, it's a very fine line between the environment, which is going to be able to allow man to survive on this earth and which is going to kill us. And I think that from a religious aspect, most people think like the world was actually constituted 6,000 years ago when God said that, okay, well, I'm going to put a sun, I'm going to put a sun in, the, in the sky, uh-huh. I'm going to put a moon in the sky, and I'm going to do all these different things. And they use that as a determination of their ability to, to survive. But if you think that the world, or know that the world is 4 billion plus years in existence, and it took a long time and a lot of different changes and a lot of different species coming and going for us to not exist on this earth, then you're going to take it with that um, um, amount of, of importance. Most people aren't going to do that. What they're going to do is say, okay, well, no, I'm going to take the 6,000 years and just accept that, that that's it. No, no more. I don't want to think about what happened preceding that because if you accept it was the 6,000 years, then regardless of your religious persuasion, you're going to be of the mind, okay, well, man is dominant on this earth, and we are the ones that control it. But in order to accept that 4 billion years was the basis for us existing right now, then you're going to have to think twice about everything that's going on and ask yourself, okay, well, if the world was in existence, which means that I'm not as important as I thought that I was as, as a human on, on this planet, then what is it that I need to do to continue to exist on this on this earth? And most people don't want to do that. They want to think like the timeline of history will be man was on this earth, then we'll go, and then somehow I guess all the planets will just disperse and everything will end. Or I'm not sure exactly how people get that right in their mind, but that's the way that they want to view it because that's the thing that's most palatable. It's not palatable to think like you aren't the center of the universe. When it comes to, to an environmental issue, it's the same thing, which is that people don't want to accept it because they have no control over it. You would have to say, okay, well, I'm doing these things that are disaffecting the environment, and then I need to stop it if I'm going to exist rather than say, well, I can fix it. Be it on the Democrat side where it'd be like, okay, well, we have the Green, green New Deal, and that's going to fix everything, or it's just to not acknowledge it as they do on the right, which is like, okay, well, climate change isn't real. These things are still disaffecting you. One might lead to disaffecting you quicker than the other, uh, with the Green New Deal being being that that object that may stop you from, from, from destroying the earth as quickly as you would if you just say, well, it's not a problem. But it's the same way as like smoking cigarettes. It's like knowing that, okay, well, cigarettes can give me lung cancer, but on the one hand, you're like, well, I'm just going to smoke anyhow, and I don't believe in lung cancer. And the other's like, well, I'll smoke three packs a week instead of my my usual nine. But yet still, more than likely, you're going to get this particular issue that's, that's going to make you sick. So most people don't want to gravitate to it because there's still some control involved. There's still some, be it that this, this acknowledgement that it's going to happen, or it's going to be, oh, well, I can control the outcome by doing this, and it's never going to overtake me. Most people can't can't understand that. In a state of shock after the war, we interrupt our program for a brief message. If you appreciate this podcast, please consider supporting Colibri on Patreon. Just go to patreon.com slash Colibri. That's K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. And now, back to our regularly scheduled... So we're talking basic denialism here. 
just taking different forms depending on people's political beliefs. Correct. Uh, and, and, and you're right. It, it's whatever it is that you have to tell you that tell yourself that you need to accept in order to get through mainstream society. So both of those mentalities are ones that are conducive to you being able to be accepted or embraced by various portions of mainstream society. It's only those who have come to can't control it. And we really need to think deeply about what it is that we have to do in order to keep this from happening, even if that's possible or not possible at this juncture. I lean towards not possible, and it's more about acceptance than anything else. But that being said, even if you do want to do something about what's going on, you would have to acquiesce to the environment. And that's something that both political parties and ideologies, because a lot of people that aren't even part of the Democrat or Republican Party still lean towards that American ideal of like, we can control it, we can do something about it. So to sit outside of the mainstream is to understand that you're going to have to, at some point, understand that, you know, in the environment doesn't, the environment controls me, I do not control the environment. And that's something that's, because over the past 200 or some odd years of American exceptionalism, where we felt like we can just do whatever and not have to answer to anybody, it's made us, felt, made us feel that we can not only control this planet, but we can even go to Mars and make changes to that planet and, and control that one, and maybe even go to Pluto or wherever, wherever it is in the, in, the, in the solar system and be able to, to not only implement whatever grand design it is that we, that we want to implement, but then also control people and make them submit to our will. Right. I mean, th this is, um, and of course here, I guess you're talking about e Elon Musk and the things he wants to do. And, and that all strikes me, the Mars thing, as being just delusionary at this point. And yet he has um, a following among a lot of people on the left or a lot of people who consider themselves intellectuals. Well, as I said, I think that it's what what we found even even through the whole coronavirus thing is that a lot of people, or at least I found this, that a lot of people who consider themselves leftists really aren't leftists. They're against the state, and that's a big difference. Because a leftist works off of principles and ideals, not just being against the state. And I think what we've seen is that a number of people can align with the right on certain issues. And even though it's, it's not conducive to what's best to most people on this planet, it's against the state. So uh, I think I understand. And, and once again, we're talking about Americans here and Americans have historically been people who have not wanted to know too much outside of their own belief system. In this country, we don't read too much. <laughs> we we don't think too much. We don't we don't rationalize. We don't actually spend too much time other than thinking about our own self interest. But even in thinking about those self interests, we don't ever align it with the people whose self interests are the same as ours. We align those self interests, or we think those self interests are, with people who are in the upper class. So. Even, so you could just as easily see somebody like uh, Donald Trump say 9-11 was an inside job, as well as you could, hit, you could see somebody who doesn't read too much and is on the lower class and says 9-11 was an inside job. And I don't want to get into the different aspects of the 9-11 uh, in, in what may or may not be, but my point being is that like you can always say, okay, well, I can align with these people because they think the same as me, even though their self-interest aren't the same as yours. But because they espouse a certain ideal, you sit, you accept it's like, oh, well, I think that same way also. And then vote against your own self-interest. So what you're detailing, detailing me is what I've seen throughout history, which is that you will look at certain people and say, okay, well, I know him, I see him. He's an individual, same as me, two feet, two legs, and everything else, and then rationalize your belief system with that person who you hold nothing in common with that is actually going to allow you to survive on this planet in a material aspect 
and where that other individual that you are aligning with is able to survive based on the fact that you don't understand what's going on in the world and your own best self-interest and the fact that you align them with his or her best interest from right. a class perspective. Right, right. Well, and class, of course, is something that, that goes basically unmentioned in the United States. Uh, I, it's, it's even worse than, than uh, race, uh, to be quite honest with you, when it comes to people's inability to actually uh, view themselves along a class aspect. But I think that that is more un-American than anything else. To view yourself along ethnic lines is something that's, to be quite honest with you, very American. Um, if you look at the history of Italians, Jewish people, Germans, Irish, all these different people, they will still embrace their ethnic differences. They still will to this day. I mean, if you go to certain places in New York or, or certain places in, uh, uh, in Appalachia, they will still em embrace their ethnic differences. They'll go back into their history and talk about it with pride. But the one thing that's never been taught with in a prideful fashion is class. It never has. You never heard that spoken with like an embrace of, oh, well, I'm of the lower class or underclass in the black communities or, or, or brown communities or, or any place else. It's seen as, a, as something you should be ashamed of and not talk about. When people talk about, discuss their uh, particular histories, they never talk about the fact, well, my family didn't have indoor plumbing until I was in 17 or 17, 18 years old, or we never had it, or I didn't have it until I moved here. They always talk about their ethnic identities. Like, yeah, we come, I come from a strong people. I come from a people who uh, worked hard or this and that. And other. But no one wants to talk about the fact that they, that they lived in a ghetto. No one wants to talk about the fact that uh, they didn't have any money. No one wants to talk about the fact that they had to live in a bedroom with their parents. These are all things that are, are seen as things you should be ashamed of. You should be scorned over. And now it's gravitated to the point where we are now reverberating to days that preceded World War II. And we're getting back to the point where people are having to live in those type of abject cir circumstances. And they're just as averse about talking about it today as they were yesterday. So at what point are you going to embrace the fact that you are going through this turmoil and address it in a sound fashion and acknowledge that you're having these particular issues? Uh, I hope to see it one day soon. I don't think that I will. Not to say that it's going to be the solution to everything, but it, it, it would at least be honest as to what everyone is going through right now. Because there are a lot of people who will be homeless in the next few months just because they don't get that $600 extra per week that they were getting when the coronavirus initially hit the United States. And, and then, and, but yet still, a lot of people would rather go homeless than acknowledge the fact that they are in a difficult position. Yeah, it's just, uh, Dave, the, uh they've really got us hoodwinked here. I mean, we really, <laughs> we, we really in this country, uh, believe all these things that, 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 that keep ourselves down. And, and, and it seems like, of course, one of the things that, that we believe in that, that, um, is another lie or whatever is the idea of democracy, which has never really existed either, you know? And, and now we're, you know, being given this just completely meaningless choice between these two people who are, you know, for all practical purposes, nearly identical. Oh, I mean, uh, I think that people need to understand that we don't live in a democracy. And as my father and my uncle told me a long time ago when I was a child, we live in a republic. We live in representative government. So that in and of itself means that you vote for this particular person. Now, if you think that your individual vote is actually going to have an effect upon the governance of this society, 
then you need to ask yourself, who is that politician beholden to? Once again, we live in a capitalist system. So what is it that allows uh, an individual to get elected to office? It's not a vote. It's the uh, amount of uh, propaganda that you can put in the media. It's the, it's the amount of influence that you can get from people who are going to provide you all the largest that you need to get elected. It's who you owe when you do finally get into office. So if I just give you my vote in a capitalist system, okay, that's one thing. If I give you a thousand dollars, two thousand dollars, a million dollars, so you can put an advertisement in mainstream media. Well, who is it that you're going to be beholden to at the end of the day? It's not going to be me and my singular vote that is the same as any number of thousands or millions or whatever office, be it local, state, federal, whatever it may be. You're going to be beholden to the people that actually provided you money in this capitalist system in order to get elected. So I think that is the problem. Most people think that just because they go in and vote that it's a democracy. Okay, well, you're allowed to vote. Well, we live in republic. And that is representative government. And you are going to represent the people who actually allowed you to get into the position that you are in. And those are money interests. Those are people who have money and they're also corporate entities that are going to be able to ply you with any amount of money it is that they need to in order for you to get in office so that you will look out for their best interests. Once again, the issue is that people align their interests with corporate interests, even though that is the one that is dictating how much money it is that they're going to make in order to survive in a capitalist system that more than likely is going to be so low that they won't be able to afford the basics that they need to survive. Because this period in, in U.S. history where, you know, more people, you know, and it was obviously still divided along racial lines, but more people were able to afford say a house or a car or whatever was uh that was a, a brief historical anomaly you know that that happened to follow a big war where everybody else's industrial capacity had been destroyed and i mean there's uh there's no going back to that ever again uh regardless of and and both 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 you know both major parties uh promise to return to that in one way or another even though it's impossible at this point What you said is uh, the exact reason why everything is that we're hearing in mainstream society is a lot, because you are 100 percent correct. Post World War II America is something that all people hold as sacrosanct. We think that we can return to 1950s Americana. And if you look at everything from the number of television shows, be it I Love Lucy, Father Knows Best, it was always the home and the hearth. And you had the, the husband that would go to work, come home, come to the suburbs. The wife was in, in pearl necklace and a dress, perfect heels. The, the kids went to, to school. They came home. They, they, the, the boys, they had dinner. They, they uh, watched television after that. The kids would be sitting in front of the fireplace reading their books of uh, and the wife would be knitting and the, and the husband would be rocking in a chair with, with a book or, or something of that nature. Yeah, that's just in general terms. But everybody wants to recapture that. And I don't care if it is a young white person today. Uh, I take that back. I don't care if it is the typical white person today because a, young, a lot of young white people are out in the street, so I don't want to denigrate them. But the typical white person today still thinks that that's possible. The typical black person today still thinks that that's possible. The typical Latino person today still thinks that that's possible. It is a thing that it has encumbered everyone from understanding exactly where we reside today as far as the ability to survive and how we cannot go back into the past and talk longingly about how we want to recapture that. It, it, it is an anomaly. You, you said it. it was a freak of nature. It was a confluence of a number of things from science, 
math, resources, and, and just an abundance of resources that we will never see again. What people don't realize, and I'll give you a bit of historical uh, um, understanding of, of resources, at one time, the barometer of what was a good find for oil was 100 barrels to one barrel. So you had to expend one barrel to get 100 barrels of oil. Now, we're at you spend one barrel to get six barrels of oil. That is called the law of diminishing returns. So we're at a point of one barrel to get six barrels. We think that somehow we can find a way to get back to a world where we can get give one barrel to get 100 barrels. That's impossible. That goes against the laws of nature, science, everything it is that actually defines this world and every other place in the universe. But people still think that that's possible. So our inability to get past that or even understand it, and even more so accept it, will always keep us from being able to deal with things in a rational manner, which I will go back once again to what it is you said as far as collapse. Sometimes collapse is a good thing because then it can jar you into understanding of exactly where it is in your plight. And right now, I see that that is the only thing that's going to be able to get people to accept exactly where we are in this moment in history. And there's, you know, analogs for that in, in nature. I mean, for example, if you look at uh, sometimes when we talk about when things go wrong, we'll call it a debacle, you know, like a, a disaster. Oh, that was just a debacle. Well, I remember looking up that word sometime once. And, and what that word comes from is from when there's a, a flash flood through an area that clears a whole stream out, you know, and like moves everything along and gives the whole thing a fresh start. And I'm like, oh, well, that's actually not a bad thing at all. And looking at where the United States is right now and looking at where, you know, industrialized technological society is right now, well, we need a debacle. We need something that could rush through at this point and clear it out so that we can do something better. It strikes me anyway. I, I agree 100 percent with that, because everything is now just a perpetual cycle of voting in the same type of individual that we had previously. So uh, I, I would discuss this with anyone. I don't think that there was any difference between George H.W. Bush and Bill Clinton. I don't think there was any difference between Bill Clinton and George W. Bush. I don't think that there's a difference between George W. Bush and Barack Obama. And I don't think ultimately there's any difference as far as the ability to be effective in Barack Obama and George Trump. I mean, excuse me, Donald Trump. <laughs> it's easy to get them mixed up. <laughs> yeah, I know. I apologize. And <laughs> Donald Trump. Yeah, I think that was probably in my uh, subconscious, but... There, there is no difference between Barack Obama and Donald Trump. And these are all the same individuals. I'd say that from a, a, a contextual aspect, as far as the amount of resources that we have available to us, there's been no difference between any of the men that I've mentioned in succession. There's, there's been no difference. Sometimes there's jobs. Sometimes there's not jobs. Sometimes there, <laughs> there's unemployment. And as a mass employment, in regards to whether it is we can discuss whether or not these particular jobs are to the betterment of, of society and humanity on a global level, I say no. But it's still, it's, it's still been somewhat the same. Now, it's going to have to take something dramatic in order to get people to understand, like, hey, me going to this job each and every day is not good for myself. My, menta my, my, my mental state, my kids, the world, and everything else. But most people still believe that just any job that has the license of mainstream society is somehow beneficial, not only to themselves, but also to wherever it is that you think is good in the world, be it religious or, 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 or constructual or, or whatever it may be. You, you believe that if I go to this job, I'm not only helping myself, but I'm helping my global community. And that's that's not the case. So 
to go back to what you were saying as far as collapse is concerned, we are at a point now where there is no way you're going to get a new nuclear engineer to understand that, okay, well, me working at this nuclear power plant is not good. I'm able to pay for my mortgage. I'm able to put my kids in a private school. Uh, I'm able to go on vacation four or six weeks out of the year. And, but, but to say that, okay, well, what I'm doing is leading to a world that might not be inhabitable for not only humans, but just life itself, it's going to take a much more drastic circumstance than what it is that we've seen because just talking to an individual like that is not acceptable because then you would have to look at yourself in the mirror and ask, why am I going into this job? What is it doing to make a better world for not only myself, my kids, but also even if you don't have kids, like I don't have kids, but just life in general. Most people aren't willing to do that. And that is something that is very un-American to, to see yourself through the lenses of what's going to affect those outside of America. And then also, uh, which is a whole other level of understanding, just life in general on this planet. So it's un-American not to be selfish. Uh, yes, very, very much so. I I, uh, I can say this from a personal aspect, and I can say that from a historical aspect, and I will discuss this with anybody who wants to. We have not seen too much of that. What we've seen is every now and again, some type of circumstance will happen where people will come together in the immediate, such as a 9-11, such as a hurricane, such as an earthquake, and we will do something for a short time period where we'll look out for our fellow man. But when it comes to the everyday aspect of looking out for the best interests of man, we are averse to that. In fact, that's when it starts to gravitate into, well, you want me to take care of you. And then also, oh, well, this sounds like socialism where you expect me to work every day in order to keep you alive and so on and so forth. So it's only in the immediate that we look out for each other. But if you're talking about just, okay, well, a change in culture, a change in mindset, a change, change in living standards, and then trying to say, oh, well, most people are willing to do that. No, they're not. No, they're not. If you take down, if you take a, a can of, of pork and beans to someone whose house was just destroyed in a hurricane, we just had a hurricane. I live in Houston, Texas, so we just had a hurricane come this way right now that hit uh, the eastern part of Texas in Louisiana up into Arkansas. If I went and took a, a can of baked beans to someone who was in, in dire straits, then I would walk away from, oh, well, that's very American. When you are at your lowest ebb, then I'm able to help you. But a sustained aspect of that which is part of humanity and whatever or what should be a part of humanity and whatever society it is that you live is something that is considered very un-American because then I'm not helping you to stand on your own two feet. I am enabling you. That's the belief in America. I'm enabling you to lean upon me in order for you to survive. I might give you a crutch, but I'm not going to hold that crutch for you. And when I walk away, you better be able to hold on to it yourself. So it, here in America, we just look at people as, I will help you as long as it's not an encumbrance upon me, and even more than encumbrance, as long as I can look at it and feel good about myself and feel I was being charitable in helping you. Yeah, I feel like I see this all the time, and I feel like I look at this and I wonder how and why it's like this and why it seems so insurmountable. And I go back and forth between is this people purposely being like this or what I also feel like I need to to mention the just overbearing power of 
what is arguably the most sophisticated propaganda machine in history that you know Americans are daily subjected to through the through the corporate media. Oh, I and I think that it's become so systemic at this juncture that the corporate media is um, a lot like, uh, uh, to be quite honest with you, it's a lot like Donald Trump or Chump, as I like to call him, uh, where I, I told people this, uh, or I t I've told people this before, which is that like the American presidency is more so just like being on autopilot, right? Like, People were just so aghast at, at Donald Trump becoming uh, president, and they thought, like, the world was going to come to an end. And I said, like, it wasn't going to come to an end. I said, it's not about any particular person or individual that's in that office. It's the same as a pilot that's in a plane. Um, if you want to talk about great pilots, we're talking about 100 years ago. Give me the Wright brothers. The Wright brothers... They were able to be a Kitty Hawk and, and jump in that plane and be able to navigate that thing so it didn't kill themselves when it landed after about 15, 20 minutes or however long it took. Um, that's real piloting. That's where you like, hey, I'm in the air. I don't know if I'm going to kill myself or kill somebody else, but I'm trying to keep this thing together. Now, we have reached a point where now, other than the fact of whatever schooling it is that you have to get through in order to be a pilot, now you get up in the air, you 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 get the get the plane level, and then after that you just go on autopilot, and you're there just in case anything goes wrong, a little turbulence, or, or or whatever it may be, and that's what the president is. He's somebody that okay, well I got elected, elected again. You once you get elected, you've gone through all that. Now you're level, so can you do everything that's necessary just to watch the dials, make sure everything's okay, and then something's going to transpire where you might have to grab the. The, the, the reins. You might have to grab the stick and, and figure out everything that's going on. And the vice president is the co pilot. Just in case you die, then, then then he'll take over. Now, Trump is that like that that's but what we've learned is that like Barry, who preceded him and who was designated as being super intelligent, we've seen no drop off for all intents and purposes between him and Trump. And the reason that's the case is because we're just on auto, autopilot right now. We do, we're just all about, we're just going, 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 and then now some turbulence will come, and the coronavirus was a turbulence, and he wasn't able to be able to commandeer the stick and, and do whatever. He almost made it four years without that being a problem because this didn't become an issue here in America until until March. So now that we have this particular issue, he may or may not be, be elected. But up until this juncture, we've seen the same thing in succession for a long time. I've gone back in my memory banks. I can't really designate a particular instance where if a particular president wasn't in power that things would have been any better or worse, to be qu quite honest with you. I, I, may, maybe I, I, if I was going to hazard a guess, Someone could say maybe it was a FDR, but I would be really hard pressed to think like anything would be different from FDR until now. So I think people don't understand that everything it is that's transpiring right now are things that are not in, in control of a particular president, which is why we put so much focus and importance on who's actually running the country. I think like from a systemic level, if you want to use the autopilot analogy, we need to be worried more so about the controls. And I think that's the issue with being a leftist is that you see like the controls are faulty and you look at everything that's going on and you're like, no, this has a problem. This has a glaring issue. We need to take care of this, this and other. So that it won't be dependent upon whoever is in the pilot seat to rectify whatever's going on in this world. We see all of the issues that's wrong with the structure in and of itself. We see that this dial is faulty. We need to change it, swap it out, make sure that it's able to designate what direction that we're going in, whatever it may be. 
And most people still think that we can just take one particular person and put them in a seat and then we can still have all these faulty dials and everything's going to be okay. So I hope that answers your question. Yes, yes. No, that, that's great. And uh, we've been talking for a little over an hour and I really appreciate you spending this time with me and I feel like maybe it's about time to, to wrap it up. And I just wanted to ask you, um, is there, uh, are there um, people or efforts that you uh, admire or that inspire you? I can honestly say that there are very few people and groups that are actually those that actually provide me comfort with everything that's going on today. Uh, personally, I work with uh, Corey Morningstar and Ron Green. Um, she is uh, one of the most dynamic uh, individuals I've ever met as far as environmental issue is concerned and just social issues in general, but specific to the environmental uh, issue uh, that I, uh, I had to say that she and working with her in that endeavor keeps me alive mentally, uh, definitely emotionally. Uh, there are various places like uh, Black, Black and Gender Report is another place that I go to uh, that I actually, actually, actually uh, Black and Gender Report is actually a place I go to that gives them a, a nuanced aspect of even the ethnic issue. I like going there. Uh, there aren't that many groups, though, that I can say specifically give me comfort is more so individual, such as you. Um, I'm not about trying to tell people that we're actually going to make it through this maelstrom of events that we see becoming more and more uh, problematic over the next few years. is going to get even worse. But it does give me a semblance of hope that for however long it is that we're here, there are some people who will uh, unite and actually fight against it and even more so provide solace to those who see that we are on the precipice of some cataclysmic stuff that more than likely is going to end us as a species. Yeah, you're not alone in, in believing that near term human extinction is certainly a possibility. And uh, you're not alone in thinking that uh, it's still worth it to try to get a try to live a good life uh, and have a positive contribution in the meantime anyway. I think that the way that you summed it up is exactly how I feel personally and everything it is that I'm trying to do for however long it is that I survive on this earth because uh, I am 47 years old and I'd say like I have more road behind me than in front of me. So the only thing I'm trying to do is apprise people of what's going on, both provide solace and then maybe uh, deal with trying to provide people the truth for however long it is that I personally survive on this planet and that I have a voice that's actually able to resonate with whoever it is that wants to listen to it. Awesome. And where can people uh, find you if they want to follow you or your work? Uh, you can always follow me on Facebook, Forrest Palmer. I'm not hard to find, but that is more of a personal nature. If you want to see my work in tandem with someone who is of the same and like minded as myself, I would say go to Wrong Kind of Green with Corey Morningstar. We're not hard to find. We're on Facebook. Uh, all you have to do is type in wrongkindofgreen.org. And there is a, a cavalcade of information about everything that, is that we discuss on a more environmental tip, but also things that are political and social in nature, which affects everybody on the planet. Voices for Nature and Peace is produced in the Gila River Valley, New Mexico, USA, on land that we acknowledge is illegally occupied Apache territory. The intro music is Zero G Yogi by Big Z, with narration by Kelly Moody of the Ground Shots podcast. This outro music is Trip A, also by Big Z. Commercial break narration by Nikki Hill. 
to become a financial supporter of this podcast and to gain access to members-only content, visit patreon.com slash colibri, K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. For more information on Radio Free Sunroot programming, please visit radiofreesunroot.com. Thank you for listening. May you find joy in your own nature and peace.